Paula, tell me when we're recording. Yes, sir, just a second. Mayor, we are recording, thank you. All right, uh, thank you and welcome everyone. This is the city of Cottonwood Heights. It is uh, Tuesday, December 1st, uh, 2020, uh, coming close to the end of a, one of the most difficult and challenging years I've been uh, a part of, and, and I'm old, so I've been a part of a lot of years. So we welcome everyone. Uh, I will begin by reading the determination, which justifies our meeting virtually. And it states, uh, pursuant to Utah code annotated 52-4207, the city's mayor as the chair of the city council hereby determines that conducting the meeting of the city council on this date at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. It is well recognized that a global pandemic currently exists related to the COVID-19 coronavirus, which has the potential to overwhelm Utah's healthcare system. Therefore, due to the state of emergency caused by the global pandemic, I find that conducting a meeting at the anchor location under the current state of public health emergency constitutes a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the location. And of course, Jen Shaw understands the reason and things behind that well, as her husband has been a representative of our community communicating those concerns. Um, you have an agenda in front of you and the first item on the agenda is review of the business meeting uh, that follows this meeting. It starts at seven o'clock. And uh, after the pledge acknowledgement, we'll have public comments. Then we have a public hearing regarding the Ferguson parking permit question. Mike uh, Johnson, are you ready to kind of introduce that to the council real quickly? Yes, um, so, so we gave the full presentation last time, the, the, uh, the proposal for the parking, uh, the expanded permit parking area um, that extends on Prospector Drive down to Honeywood, Honeywood Hill Lane, I believe it's called. Um, this is the required public hearing. So the proposal and the petition remains the same. Um, I'll bring the map up in the meeting um, just as an introduction to the public hearing, and I can have that on the screen. Uh, we've received a, a numerous public comments, which uh, most of them have been forwarded to you. We have received a few this afternoon that will uh, be sent to you after the meeting. Uh, many of them are very similar. They're from uh, neighbors on Quicksilver Drive, um, just wanting to expand the, the permit area in that direction as well. Uh, we looked into that. We, we, we think we'll, we'll keep looking into the ordinance there, but we think that would probably require a separate petition process. Um, but so you have those public comments and then uh, there, there may be more joining. We noticed um, the, the direct affected area plus 500 feet in every direction. Um, so, so I think the word got out in the area pretty well. And, and um, like I said, tonight's the public hearing and then final decision will be scheduled two weeks from now. Now, Tim or, or Shane, it's my understanding based upon the ordinance that we must take action within 30 days. Is that right? That's correct. 30 days of the public hearing, which is okay. tonight. Yeah, so the only opportunity would be in the the next scheduled meeting, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, after the public hearing, uh, we have uh, two action items. The first is adopting an annual meeting schedule, which I assume is still the first and third Tuesday of each month. Tim, any comments regarding that meeting schedule or anyone from the council? Again, the only comment, to... oh, go ahead. Sorry, again, I was just saying you can comment. Again, I think it's important to understand that uh, as a need arises, we can alter that going forward if we find that uh, we have to have a special meeting or, uh, um, or something comes up and we have to change it, we can do that. But we need to, we need to uh, publish an annual schedule. Yeah, and the schedule includes the, the public meetings that the council has, the city council meetings, and then the planning commission, architectural review, and appeals hearing officers. So we've included that as well. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Uh, then the uh, 5.2, the other action item is the 
consulting agreement uh, with Bill and Collins Associates regarding a stormwater utility uh, program. Uh, uh, it's a study. Um, Matt, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, Mayor and Council, thank you. This is the, uh, we brought it to you a couple of weeks ago as an initial uh, review from the Council. This is for the stormwater fee that we've been discussing pretty much throughout this year um, and putting together the program for the stormwater fee and bringing so that we'll have something we can bring with the, to the Council for comments and then also at some point as the council has directed, taking it to the public for public input and comment before there's an implementation of any stormwater fee. And this sets up the program so that we all have something we can comment on and look at. And the cost of the study I understand is about 40,000, is that right? Roughly about 40,000 coming out of the uh, impact fee money for stormwater, yeah. which is what it's delegated for. Questions, comments regarding that study? Okay. Uh, that pretty much uh, is the agenda for the um, business meeting. Uh, uh, relatively short, uh, but uh, uh, we'll make up for it in our uh, December 15th meeting. Uh, moving back to the work session. Um, Every, I think it's every six months, we ask our council members to report on their liaison responsibilities as we all sit on various committees. And so uh, uh, we'll, we'll do that this evening and uh, um, we'll start with uh, council member Michael, who is our liaison to the parks, trails and open space committee. So I know we have a special guest. So Christine, do you want to introduce her? Sure. Thanks, Mayor. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce you all to Jennifer Folsted Shaw. If you haven't met her, she is the newly appointed chair of the Parks, Trails, and Open Space Committee. Um, she, prior to that, she was the, I guess you were the vice chair, right, last year, and we couldn't get enough of Jen. <laughs> and so she was unanimously elected for the next two year term following Melissa Fields. Um, she has a great presentation for you all tonight, including the wonderful things that they've been working on over the last year or two, and then what um, things we could look forward to hearing from them over the next two years. Um, so with that, I'll give uh, Dr. Shaw the, uh, the camera. I don't, do you have, are you ready to put that on the screen. Okay. I am Christine. Thanks for the introduction and thank you mayor and the rest of the council members for the invitation to uh, meet with you tonight. Now, let's see. So I'm just going to share my screen and try and get through this presentation for all of you in my 10 minutes. Can everyone see the screen? We can. Great. Um, so our current membership has changed somewhat in the last year. We have three new members who are denoted by um, the names with the asterisks, but we have a lot of uh, members who have been retained since our committee has been formed, which is really great for the committee and the momentum that we have uh, to move forward this year with a lot of projects that are underway. Um, so this presentation is going through several goals of our committee and some of the accomplishments that we have made really since an inception, but highlighting much of what's been done in the last year. Our first goal is to create awareness of existing parks, trail, and open space opportunities. And as many of you are probably aware of, we have this wonderful new online and um, uh, uh, hard copy formats of walking tours in our city, which is, has been a great partnership between the Parks, Trails and Open Space Committee, as well as the Historic Committee. Really trying to highlight um, the wonderful opportunities to get to know our, our neighborhoods better and to um, highlight some of the interesting history that our city has. So the there's a URL link at the bottom of this uh, slide that takes you to where you can find the online format of these walking tours that Melissa Blue did a great job of putting into an ArcGIS storyboard. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't already. 
um, that was the way that we could not only show the tour maps, but a lot of the historic photos. And then Andy Helka helped put together the PDF formats of the tours that are um, available for downloading, but also some hard copies have been put in the rec center and um, the library as well as city hall. Um, this slide just shows an example of one of the walking tours right around city hall. Another way that we've created awareness of existing um, parks, trail, and open space are through our monthly newsletter articles that Melissa Fields has penned throughout um, since we formed the committee. And um, we've also been working closely with the planning staff on wayfinding along the Bonneville or the Big Cotton Canyon Trail. Um, that particular project has been put on hold due to the status of track funding. Um, but hopefully that'll move forward if track funding is reinstated this year. And I understand maybe Mayor Peterson can give us more of an update on that. Our second goal was to create awareness of new parks, trails, and open space opportunities. Um, in part, this had to, well, all of this right now is focusing on uh, the Bonneville Shoreline Trail and the o Utah Open Lands um, parcel that was recently uh, preserved as open space. So Melissa Fields penned on behalf of our committee um, an op-ed piece to the Salt Lake Tribune that I think really helped us raise some of the major dollars that went towards this campaign. And I thank all of you for your hard work, reaching out to other agencies in the Valley um, who've, who really provided a lot of the major dollars going towards this campaign. Um, the committee also worked closely with Blue Line Designs on the Bountyville Shoreline Trail Access Master Plan, and we helped host an open house in February. You've all seen that master plan and have voted on it. So I'll just move on from here. Our third goal is to create um, programs to introduce citizens to existing new opportunities related to our, our parks and open space. Um, we had an event uh, where we tested out a dog park idea at the Bark in the Park Off Leash event at Mount View Park in, in September of 2019. Um, and so I'll come back to that when we talk more about the dog park. But um, Mike Menson on our committee really came up with this idea of naturalist talks at, talks at our city parks. And he and other committee members have helped put a, together a whole slate of programming ideas that were set to roll out this past year, but due to COVID-19, we've had to postpone it. Hopefully though, we'll be able to institute that in maybe in the coming year, if not in subsequent years. So we could have a monthly talk in June, July, and August and September of each year and rotate at different parks. Um, right now, we're also talking about potentially um, instituting an, a donation program for folks who are interested in donating items such as benches to our various parks to help bolster the amenities that we have at our parks and also give folks an opportunity to memorialize loved ones, either living or deceased through these donations. Our fourth goal was to enhance the interconnectivity of trails in our community and adjacent communities. And I, I'm really proud of this effort. Um, we've worked closely again with the planning department on uh, highlighting where we can um, enhance existing trails, both urban trails as well as soft path trails, but also look for linkages uh, in terms of bike paths, urban trails, et cetera. And so this figure just shows one of the um, ways, you can see all the dashed lines are proposed trails um, in just one part of the city. And so there's a lot of opportunities to connect existing um, resources that we have for our citizens. Um, the city has also been successful in completing two trails, the um, extension of the Big Cottonwood Canyon Bike Trail, as well as the East Jordan, Jordan Canal Trail. Um, but we're working on some other proposed trails in the near future with the Fort Union multi-use paths as Fort Union gets redeveloped. Um, also the Canyon Rim Trail, which would connect Prospector Drive um, on the uh, east bench to the Canyon Rim development. Uh, there's also the Union View Trail that would connect the Union View subdivision um, above the Union Park complex so that those residents can easily walk down to the stores in that area. And then we're focusing on the Bonneville Shoreline Trail alignment um, with the Bonneville Shoreline Coalition um, and also trying to keep our eye out for opportunities to um, actualize the connector trails that are in various master plans. Our fifth goal, which is probably the biggest news recently, was to preserve 
natural open space, and we've done that with conservation, uh, 26 acres at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon with the help of the Utah Open Lands Campaign. Um, thank you again so very much for all your help on that. We've also worked on developing a new ordinance focused on repairing protection, which is tied to the sensitive lands ordinance revision underway. And we have been, are going to be participating with the Seven Canyons Visioning Plan, which is more of a regional effort to look at how we can preserve um, natural features along our tributaries. Um, and thanks to the Cottonwood um, Foundation, we provided matching grants that helped secure funding from the Wasatch um, Front Regional Council to the Seven Kings Trust to administer this plan. Our sixth goal was to enhance the character, livability, um, and um, in our city parks through um, various efforts. We've done multiple tree planting events and planted over 50 trees in the last couple of years. Um, on a Halloween, we did a, a cleanup of trash at Crestwood Park, and here you see Mike Minson down in the creek itself, um, getting some of that trash, and we've filled several large garbage bags, although the park's in really good condition. Um, we were surprised by how little trash we actually found. Um, Aaron Davis on our committee has been in, in dialogue with Salt Lake County uh, about C Crestwood Park for the last couple of years, and as a result of her efforts, uh, the surface trails have been um, refinished in the park and the bridge there has been shored up um, to improve public safety. Um, ben Hill also submitted a track grant for Anzac Park redevelopment, but that was denied. However, if track funding is reinstated, he will um, submit another proposal uh, to try and uh, redevelop the park. Um, as you are all well aware, we are interested in having a dog park in our community and our our committee has been very much involved in those conversations and taking a look at proposed plans um, at, along Wasatch Boulevard. And we're currently doing a review of park amenities throughout our parks and considering applying for a Utah Outdoor Recreation Mini Grant to um, um, potentially purchase um, more benches, et cetera, in places where it's needed. Um, so, I highlighted some of this already, and you're going to be talking about the expansion of the parking permit area near Ferguson Canyon. Although we're not intimately um, initiating this uh, endeavor, we're well aware of it because it will um, certainly affect our activities related to the enhancement of the Ferguson overflow lot and potential creation of a dog park in that area. So whatever help that you need from our committee, please let us know. Um, we're happy to be of service. Um, and we have been, we've helped improve accessibility and safety through reviews of all the master plans listed here, the Wasatch Boulevard master plan, open space, Bonneville Shoreline Trail Access Plan, as well as the forestry plan, which has um, some features in it that um, are related to the removal of potentially dangerous trees, as well as trying to enhance more tree um, coverage in our community. Um, and finally, our last goal is to enhance partnerships with other local and regional entities. Uh, and we've done that, um, I think, very well through all these endeavors that I've just shared with you. Uh, I won't go through this list, but, and, but I just wanted to show that it's a diverse list and it's not even all of the entities that we've been working with, but just some of the major ones. Um, and then these images are just showing some of the tree planting activities that have occurred both um, at some of our local schools. And then the image at City Hall here was the tree planting that occurred um, this past September. It was really an effort on the part of um, the Butlerville Day Committee, but several of our committee members came out and, and lended a hand and we were able to get um, 15 trees between the City Hall and the Rec Center in place really quickly. Okay, so um, I've kind of highlighted where we're going in 2021. I'll just leave this um, slide up for you to take a look at um, while I take any questions that the committee may have. Well, Jennifer, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, you know, thank you personally and, and thank you for Melissa Fields for the last uh, two plus years where she's chaired to this point and for Councilman Michael for leading this effort. I think we you know, my passion for parks, trails, and open space, why as a mayor, it's one of my highest priorities was creating this committee and 
applaud Christine and, and you and, and Melissa for just taking taking this direction and, and getting the most out of us. So I'm I'm just impressed as could be. So so thank you. Any any comments from the rest of the council? Yeah, yeah. I Go do ahead. real quick, Mayor. I, I would second what you said. i I'm thrilled we have park trails and open space and they've been a huge asset to the city. I've been um, bugging Tim a little bit and I'll just plant this seed since I've got you, Jen, and, and Jim is on here as well with the historic committee. I think if we had a QR code associated with those um, web pages with the urban trails, we could incorporate the, that QR code onto historic signs throughout the city and on brochures that we print and then people can quickly access um, all that content. So QR code, that's my, that's my seed I'm planting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tally. Other questions, comments? Again, uh, Jennifer, thank you so much and uh, appreciate it. And anything we can do, just let us know on me personally as well. All right, let's move on to uh, the next committee report. Uh, uh, Council Member uh, Bruce, uh, the Historic Committee and Mosquito Abatement and Emergency Planning. So go ahead. Okay, we'll start with Historic Committee since we've got Jim Kitchis on here. He is the Assistant Director at the Utah State Archive, a lifetime resident of Cottonwood Heights, and he's been the Chair of the Historic Committee for just over a year now having served on the committee since 2017. Um, Jim is a tremendous asset. And I don't know if you guys have seen the Facebook posts, but there's a lot of um, thought and substance and really quality content. Jim has a slideshow for us as well. So I will let him take it away and then I'll do the other two committees. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor and City Council, for the, the chance to uh, uh, update you on what the Historic Committee has been up to. Let me see if I can share this really quick. Hold on one second. Are you seeing my screen okay? We are. Okay, perfect. Well, um, like I said, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to, to give you an update on what the Historic Committee has been up to this year. Um, the first major initiative we took on in, in 2020 was developing a strategic plan for our committee that will cover the years 2020 through 2025. Um, the intent was really to coordinate our committee activities and work to ensure that the goals and activities that we're pursuing as a committee are in alignment with the city's objectives and the authorizing uh, mandate language in, in the city ordinance that creates the historic committee. So based on that work, we were able to uh, come up with three key goals that we've kind of organized uh, as a committee around. The first is our goal to provide the city's history to its citizens. And the intent here is to work actively to provide information about the history of the city to its citizens through a variety of analog and digital means. Um, where we saw success this year with this goal uh, was for, uh, through um, providing regular features and facts for inclusion in the city newsletter, responding to general information requests that come in from citizens, um, and uh, partnering with the Parks, Trails, and Open Spaces Committee to develop walking tours uh, with the historical context that citizens can enjoy. And I think um, our, our uh, committee, two of our committee members uh, deserve special recognition for the work they put in that into that. Uh, Carol Woodside, our committee secretary, and Gail Conger, who is the longest serving uh, member on our committee. They were both instrumental in taking on a uh, leadership role in uh, partnering with, with the Trails and Open Spaces Committee to really provide a, a final product that I think everyone is very, very proud of. Um, another accomplishment in alignment with, with goal number one here was um, with the onset of of COVID and, and uh, sort of the change in, in the world, um, it was suggested that we create a Facebook page for the committee, which we did. And uh, that has been proven to be highly successful. Um, it's connected the committee and the city with uh, our, our citizens and community members. Um, it's allowed us to um, uh, provide information on different activities, different things that people might find of interest and to provide uh, just general information about the city's history that we, we think people would enjoy. Um, we, we are able to make multiple posts per week. 
And we've seen our engagement numbers uh, that, that Facebook provides uh, really steadily growing uh, with, with that work. So we've been happy with that. We, we think there are some other opportunities to continue to build on that success, but that has been a success for us this year. Um, also with goal number one, um, we uh, formed a working group that's responsible for administering a oral history and storytelling initiative. So the idea here, and this is being spearheaded by our committee vice chair, Ken Verdoya, um, is to really target some of the um, uh, older, uh, or some of the people, longstanding residents in our, our community, and possibly some of the newer transplants to our community. Really, there, there isn't a requirement uh, for this, but really the idea is we want to uh, be able to gather information from, from the folks who have lived here and eventually bring that in and make that part of our committee archive. And once it's there, we can repurpose it in a lot, a variety of different ways uh, that could be very, very exciting. Um, again, because of the, the world kind of shifting suddenly, we didn't get quite as far with this goal as we would have liked. Um, Ken is very adamant that uh, he really needs sort of face-to-face -face time with people. And obviously that's, that's hard to do right now. Um, one success we did in kind of building this though is uh, completing a release form that was approved by uh, the city attorney that will allow us to, once we are able to go in and, and start having conversations with people, we'll have a release form that will allow uh, that to come into the city's um, uh, uh, holdings. Uh, so our next goal, was to administer our committee archives. Um, since its inception, the committee has gathered a variety of records and generated a variety of records on its own. Um, some of these are pretty uh, just in need of management in terms of just managing and kind of uh, weeding away. Others are very historically significant, including a variety of things that have been brought or donated to the city by citizens that have historic value. So with this goal, it really, uh, became incumbent on us to create a working group who went in um, uh, to analyze what we actually had in the, the committee's archives, the committee's holdings. Um, in the early part of, of this year, we were able to do that. We were going in on about a weekly basis to inventory the records and, and um, just get a greater degree of intellectual control over what we're actually dealing with. Um, it was a very uh, fun task uh, to, to work with committee members on this. Um, I would say before we were, um, we kind of had to put a pause on things, we're about 75% of the way through that project. So um, in the coming year, the plan is, as we're able to go return to City Hall, hopefully, and, and get back into those records, we'll be um, uh, uh, able to finish up that project. And like I said, it contains, uh, the, the committee records contain a variety of things that have been donated that really could be repurposed in a lot of exciting ways, um, possibly through digitization and sharing uh, online through some different platforms. Um, so the, the committee is very excited to get this one uh, completed. Our third goal was to take a lead on historic preservation in the city. So we, uh, the intent here is to develop and administer our archive um, and um, Oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've put the wrong intent, intention language in there. No, I'm sorry, the, the goal here is to um, uh, take a lead on, on historic preservation in the city at, as per our ordinance. Um, and our accomplishments uh, here, we were able to uh, maintain our status with the state's historic uh, preservation office as a certified local government representative, which allows us uh, opportunities to apply for different grants and, um, and acknowledgements as a, as a CLG, um, as, as it's called. Um, we also formed a working group that was able to utilize some intensive level survey information that was uh, captured as part of a former historic preservation grant, which we then used to contact homeowners in the city who have historic homes to let them know about the status of their homes as a historic home and um, solicit their, uh, the opportunity for them to possibly participate as um, uh, recipients or their homes as recipients of designation as a national historic site. We were able to receive a few comments back from homeowners who are interested in that. So we will be actively working in the coming year to uh, uh, apply for a, a grant through the state's historic preservation office that would allow us to um, get those homes on the historic register and also uh, possibly do more intensive level survey work on some of the other buildings and homes around the city where really that process is 
um, just gathering as much information about the his history of a place as possible so that we have it for a variety of different purposes. Um, so with that, that's kind of what we've accomplished this year. Um, we definitely, we've had discussions about where we want to go in 2021. A lot of it is building on um, some of the goals that we've set forth and some of the accomplishments we saw in 2020. Uh, just to kind of hit the high notes on some of them. We're looking to uh, revamp some of the parts of the historic committee that appear on the city website. So assisting um, with that and trying to get some of the, uh, the language updated. Uh, we were able to actually put out this year um, through uh, thanks to uh, the help of Ann Etchell, we're now selling the city's history online, uh, the, the book that was published. So people can uh, uh, purchase that online. Um, so we want to kind of build on that and just make our little corner of the city's website as uh, dynamic and helpful to, to people as possible. We want to continue with our social media push and just continue to build and, and grow that as much as possible. We're seeing really good engagement when we post things. You went mute, Tim. Jim, you're still muted. Um, obviously, oh, a lot. Yes. You were muted for uh, about one minute. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Now we, we hear you fine. Now go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of covering our uh, our goals for 2021 and where we're going. Um, uh, we're going to continue to build on our social media uh, successes. Uh, if there's a Butlerville Days in, in 2021, we're looking to, again, have an exhibit uh, as part of, of Butlerville Days. Um, we haven't discussed what that would be, but we've got more than enough material from our city archives that we can, we can pull together a, a quality exhibit. We've had discussions as a committee of, uh, around the idea of possibly um, exploring the idea of having a, a veterans monument. Uh, possibly something that could be um, at City Hall that would honor the veterans who have served in our community. So we're going to explore that as a, as a possible idea uh, for 2021. Um, we're going to continue, uh, as I said earlier, with our, our oral history initiative. Um, if we're able to actually sit down with folks one-on-one um, -on -one in person, um, we'll be able to, to continue that work. Um, we're very close to uh, finishing up our inventory work of the city archives, and I'm expecting a lot of fun and exciting initiatives to grow out of that. And uh, we're going to continue to work to maintain our, our uh, certified um, local government status and potentially apply for th that grant that I mentioned that would uh, help us get some homes on the historic register and um, continue with our intensive level survey of the historic homes and buildings in, in our city. Um, so with that, that's, that's what I've prepared. I'm more than happy to take any questions if, if well, no, Jim, thank, thank you very much. And especially a personal thanks for sharing your expertise. I know you're, uh, when it comes to archiving that you bring a skill that any committee like this would love to have and appreciate your efforts. And, uh, again, like partial and open space, I, I spent uh, six or seven years with the historic committee. So it's, it's something I support. Wholeheartedly, and, and thank you, uh, Councilman Bruce, for your leadership in that committee too. It's it's important to have the council relationship with the committee so they know of our support. So thank you. Any questions or comments of uh, uh, to Jim from the council? I would say thank you, Jim. We're really lucky to have you. <laughs> Historic committee is really yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Right. Uh, Councilor Bruce, you got a couple of the committees you want to. I, I do. I was going to tell. Um, I was going to tell Jennifer and Jim. Don't feel obligated to stick around for the duration of our meeting. <laughs> um, jumping on to emergency management, quick update. They did their shakeout event last month uh, while I was in Mexico, so I apologize for contributing to their lower participation numbers. They typically align that shakeout drill with the state drill and it tends to create a lot of media buzz and attention. So they didn't get that alignment this year and numbers were down a little bit. They had 16% um, response as a city in 2019 and it dropped down to 10.6% this year, but they were still able to exercise the communication piece between the block captains and the precincts and the districts. And most importantly, that red tag procedure Hopefully the community is all learning that 
that red tag tied to the front door of the outside of the house is what lets emergency responders know there's a critical incident in that home. So they were able to refine some processes around that. And then kudos to Carlos and his team. They took um, second in the nation on field day with the amateur radio club. They always come in first or second in the nation. So we're really lucky to have that uh, amateur radio club here within the city. Um, and then finally, mosquito abatement. We, uh, we're part of the South Salt Lake Mosquito Abatement District and they run a really tight ship. They're consistently on their game. It's been uh, 857 days since they last had a safety incident. So very impressive. Mosquito season wraps up at the end of September with just a few more treatments in October. And then during the winter months, they're pretty much analyzing and preparing for the next season. There were a couple cases of West Nile uh, born transmission here in Utah this last year, but no deaths, 14 deaths nationally from West Nile. And that's it for my committees. Anybody has a question or comment? Any questions of Council Member Bruce? If not, again, appreciate you uh, representing us on those committees. I, I think that's just critical. And so thank you. Thank you too. Uh, Let's move on to Utah League of Cities and Towns and uh, Councilor Michael and uh, along with uh, our city manager, that's an incredibly critical committee. And so uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of update of how that's going, where we are as we start the legislative session here around the corner. Council Member Michael, do you want me to start or do you want to talk first about that? No, you, you, you can. I think you've had more recent discuss, discussions um, with for lobbyists, so it's probably more appropriate. Thanks. Yeah, so we, I, I'll just share a few things real briefly. Uh, the committee's been meeting about every other month. And then as we go into the legislative session, obviously in January, it will be weekly meetings, uh, which will continue. One of the big themes, obviously, this, this the last several months has been the, the challenges with COVID and with the CARES Act funding. Um, one of the things that was highlighted in one of our recent meetings is we we're very fortunate in our state that the CARES Act funding, the pass through to communities and cities has uh, been extensive, which in some states that's not occurring. And we've benefited from that as a community to try to uh, have resources to address COVID issues. They talked about how advocacy is going to change because of COVID. This it changed last year, but it will continue through this legislative session. And so it's going to mean that our lobbyists and, and us as city representatives are really going to have to work more closely in reaching out with our uh, legislators because there's going to be more limited uh, opportunities up at the uh, session. They're not really allowing a lot of people up there. And so that, that was, that's been a big thing they've talked about. There's been a lot of discussion with the Love, Listen, and Lead Task Force um, related to public safety and uh, community uh, work in police. And there's going to be a number of bills. Um, they, they've set up to, I think 72 is the last count of bills that are going to be ad addressing issues related to police work. Um, there's also a lot of issues related to affordable housing and land use that are going to be coming up and community reinvestment. And so all of these things are, are what they've highlighted over the last couple of meetings. I think the main takeaway that they really emphasized at the last meeting, which was a couple of weeks ago, was keep in contact with our legislators and advocate um, for the community issues that we're facing in this upcoming legislative session. That's, that's a summary of what they've reported. I've provided this information to you as we've had these meetings in the council communications as well. So I'm just reiterating it. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Christine, any additional comments? No, uh, Tim did a great job summarizing it. Thanks. Yeah, it, it just uh, related to that, uh, we're still looking at the best way to handle our legislative breakfast because of COVID. And we'll be talking more about that going forward, I think. All right, uh, Council Member Peterson, you want to talk about the Arts Council and our business association? Certainly, Mayor. Uh, it's like all of the committees, it's been a little bit difficult, but the Arts Council is moving uh, in a very wonderful uh, direction. They've they've had, I don't know, hopefully many of you have got the opportunity to see the, 
the art show that they had, the virtual art show, and some of those amazing entries that uh, actually won the awards. Uh, if you get a chance, if you haven't signed up for that, I'd love to be able to see, see that done. Uh, and Etchell, of course, works closely with the, the committees. They're fully staffed. They've, uh, they've got a virtual Santa Claus uh, meeting with over, right now I think there's over 150 uh, children that will be able to meet virtually with Santa Claus. And uh, that's, that's going to take place this Saturday. Santa is going to be busy. Uh, he's gonna be uh, operating from uh, nine o'clock a.m. till seven o'clock p.m. So uh, there, there will be a few breaks there for Santa. But uh, the, the Arts Council also has been very involved with Facebook. If you get a chance to pull that up, they have increased, uh, with the art show alone, they've increased, uh, they've had 4,243. It's up 200, uh, over 200% uh, of their viewers and a lot of post engagements. So they, they are hoping and they're planning on uh, preparing for Matilda, if they can get going by uh, uh, probably, they think in, in May, uh, they're hoping by May, we're gonna watch that and see how that goes. But they've, they've, we've got a lot of talent on the committee and they are, they're raring to go, but they are, they're not sitting, sitting still, they're, they're still working, they're preparing, uh, they've cleaned out closets, they've, they've got a lot of things for, uh, for costuming and everything, the Arts Council is, is definitely engaged. And then tonight there will be a tree lighting that that's also gonna be take place if we can. I think I believe that 645, is that right, Mayor? Uh, 630, 645, we'll do it, we'll do it quickly because we gotta be back, so. Yeah, so, well, I'll, I'll be quick and there's, but there's a lot going on. If anybody in, within the sound of my voice can make sure they sign up for the Arts Council on uh, Facebook and they can be in touch with that. There's so much going on right now that, uh, they, they're very busily, busily engaged and actively engaged, but uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful committee to be in, a part of. Thank you. They definitely uh, make our city uh, look good. So we appreciate your efforts with that committee and hopefully they feel our support through your uh, communication from the council. Great. Thanks, Mayor. You want to talk about the business association? I know these are challenging times for our small businesses. This has been a very interesting time. I know with the latest uh, situations with that, a lot of things have changed. A lot of businesses have been in touch about uh, a lot of the different loan programs that they've had. I know that uh, Shri has been very involved uh, with, with businesses trying to get the word out on that. Uh, this new round is kind of faced, has uh, some new challenges that uh, small businesses have. A lot of it is unique to businesses that have a lot of foot traffic and different things like that. Uh, so it is an interesting spectrum of, of challenges for different types of business, but business is continuing uh, in, in a still really quite an effective manner. Uh, we saw that through, obviously the, the sales tax revenues were, were much better than we anticipated. Uh, and those, those, I guess there, there is another round of uh, aid that will be coming and we'll kind of look at that and see how that affects those businesses within Cottonwood Heights. Thank you. Hopefully we'll continue uh, discussions uh, with a relationship to chambers and how we can continue to serve those small businesses in addition to this, the financial things. But I know that uh, COVID's impact that. So again, hopefully they, uh, uh, understand our, our commitment to serve them any way we can. So thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Thanks, Moving Mayor. on, I know time is short, but uh, we wanna make sure we get all these reports in. Uh, Councilmember Bracken, you've got four committees that you uh, raise on to. Maybe you could update us on the status of those. Well, some of those are fairly easy. Uh, the Butler Relays Committee, um, obviously we weren't able to have that event, but the, as, as previously mentioned, um, the tree planting that they were doing in conjunction with the 15th uh, year did go forward. There are some trees that got planted there with help of some of the other committees. Um, and we will see what happens again this coming year. Um, uh, meet monthly with uh, CH2 with the uh, Common Heights Parks and Recreation 
center, um, a lot of details. Um, uh, Matt Ship and uh, Tim Tingy do a lot of the heavy lifting on our end. Um, just making sure that uh, the parks are getting taken care of, the trails are getting picked up and clean, things are happening. Um, they, I know they just worked on um, the rec center's budget uh, will we'll have been going for approval here very soon. They needed to get their amendment done. Um, uh, but it's, it's nice to just check in there and have that crossover so that things continue to run smoothly. Um, we had um, uh, Pam come during our last meeting and she gave a pretty good update on what was going on with Wasatch Front Waste and Recycling. Um, the most notable on that is that they will continue to do the area cleanup program again this year, the way that they did it this last year, where, they, where you actually call and reserve a trailer. Um, uh, part of that's due just from staffing and uh, being able to keep socially distant from um, the people and having the, there, there's a health risk with having uh, the containers and sometimes the piles of a waste to get collected around them on the streets. And so um, uh, I will be starting in January, my official year as the chair of that committee. Um, I kind of was prematurely promoted to that uh, a few months ago when uh, the chair uh, purchased a new home across the street and out of the city he lived in. <laughs> and so he needed to resign. Um, the uh, Youth Council, uh, they were very glad to be able to get back to meeting. Um, we are doing Zoom meetings. Uh, we are doing virtual educational uh, meetings. Those go uh, fairly easily. Um, we, this Thursday, we're actually doing a virtual service project. Um, our service officer has got uh, fabric packs put together for each member to pick up at City Hall. And we'll be doing, um, I think it's caps or some sort of a uh, of a service project that we can put together and then they go to the road home or other types of uh, places like that with people who need, um, you know, I, I think they're caps or, or hats or something like that for the colder weather. Um, we are also trying to figure out what we can do this year to uh, kind of keep that cohesive together. But the kids that we've got there now um, are, are really good as always. Um, we did not get a large influx of Freshman this year, just um, the uh, day that I was slated to go to Butler Middle School and do that presentation was uh, three days after the world ended. So <laughs> that never actually occurred, but we, uh, I will try to get back out there this year and, uh, and uh, so we can keep um, fresh blood coming in. But there's some really, as always, really good kids on the Youth Council. Um, as Ann Etchell needs things for the city done, they're always willing to step up and help. Um, I think that uh, covers uh, most of that. Thing, things are running well. It, it has been different to do, uh, do Zoom meetings with Youth Council, but uh, uh, it, it has been working out. I've learned a few things about Zoom. Let's just say that, uh, um, that that's been easy. Okay, thank you, Councilman Brack, and I, those are uh, great reports and uh, uh, excellent representation on those committees. And I especially appreciate uh, your CH2 meeting because you don't just have that meeting, but also the, the Rec Center for participating in our Parks, Trails, and Open Space Committee. That's a good collaborative effort there. So we appreciate those efforts. Uh, any questions of Councilman Bracken from the Council? Hearing none, I'm going to move very quickly. Uh, I have a lot of committees, but I'm going to be very, very brief. And uh, if we have questions, uh, we'll try and answer them uh, best of my ability or I'll communicate later. Uh, one of my uh, first committees that I'd like to report on is the Central Wasatch Commission. As you all know, it's a highly visible uh, organization because of uh, uh, UDOT and its EIS study. But uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a two day uh, summit on, on transportation issues. <laughs> Because it is so complex and so many questions, what I've asked is the representative from CWC to actually to come to our next meeting to give you more detail um, as to how that is progressing. Um, I think there are many uh, 
issues with that uh, summit and it, its findings and recommendations that need to come to our council as a whole, especially with the EIS that uh, UDOT is putting out that has some additions to the three alternatives to add additional alternatives that impact to Wasatch Boulevard and our city. So rather than spending a lot of time giving you a lot of detail, uh, I've made it real clear to the CWC of, of our concerns uh, of unintended consequences and challenges specifically face our city. Uh, uh, outside of transportation, which is, is, is a major focus, um, they are looking at uh, reintroducing uh, the federal legislation uh, in next year. So they've put together another draft is out for public comment. Um, and that's also um, something that uh, will impact us because of the uh, conservation uh, uh, recreation area of, of, of the Wasatch Front. In addition to that, they've funded several small projects uh, in our mountains from trail improvements to contributions to our uh, efforts with uh, Utah Open Lands and many other small interim things. And we can share that with you later too without going into a lot of detail. But anyway, it takes a lot of time because I sit on transportation committee as well as one of the uh, commissioners. Also, I sit on conference of mayors. Uh, we meet each month. Uh, We've talked about stormwater fees, uh, police advisory boards. Uh, uh, most cities have a stormwater fee and find them very valuable. Um, and I think you've seen reports of that from staff. Uh, I found it interesting on police advisory boards that that's actually more common than I realize. It's something that I think we're going to want to pursue in some fashion based upon uh, a comment from uh, our council. Uh, we regularly have uh, Utah League of uh, Cities and Towns, Cameron Deal, who brings us up to date on legislation. You've heard about that, but we also look at it as uh, uh, the Conference of Mayors. Um, we've also talked about, you know, plastic grocery bags and when are we gonna do something about those? Homelessness, uh, of course, the love, listen, lead efforts. So a whole variety of issues as mayors, we share perspective and best practices. And uh, uh, those are quite interesting meetings. Uh, I also sit on COG, which is a Council of Government. Uh, uh, primarily what happens there is we talk about some uh, common uh, uh, issues, uh, but uh, also most importantly, that's where you get appointed to other important committees that affect our city. That's where my appointment comes to be on the track advisory board uh, who recommends funding for efforts. And uh, I've advocated to be on that board because it's relates to us directly and, and I can facilitate uh, the interests of our city. So I recently uh, uh, regained my appointment to the track advisory board. I also sit on the ZAP tier two advisory board where we review and recommend funding to, I think it's close to 200 applications on uh, the arts and uh, then assured that ours was funded through there as well as many other programs across the valley. Um, also, my appointment from COG is to be on the Public Works Committee, where we look at funding um, uh, open space that is not, well, open space is a little bit of a misnomer. It's, uh, uh, it's lands that, are, that need to be saved for right-of-ways of, of roads and things throughout our valley. Most of the funding in the past has gone to uh, the west side of our, our, our valley because of um, the growth out there, but we've had some funding come to us in recent years, especially with the roundabout. So I represent our city and I'm a, a, one of three or four mayors that sit on that to guide its, its uh, use of those uh, funds that come through on some special taxes. Um, because of, of COVID, uh, the amount of money that's been available there, uh, we usually met twice a year. Um, now we're waiting until we have at least about four or $5 million in that fund before we will meet our next time. Another important committee is uh, uh, UFA, which I attend those meetings monthly. Uh, it's to me one of the most important uh, boards that I sit on uh, because of our, our representation there to uh, facilitate our first responders. Uh, excellent committee with excellent leadership. Uh, I also sit on the finance committee where we've talked about everything from CARES Act funding to COVID impacts, uh, staffing issues uh, uh, like our city, uh, they'll be looking at uh, updating their uh, uh, 
salary and benefits packages here for January 1, but a lot of information there and, and I could share in detail sometime if uh, you would like more detail, but uh, right now, as you've met with uh, Chief Peterson, I think you all understand the, uh, the, the quality of leadership is there and the, the quality we get from their service to our city. And I shared with you about ZAP tier two already and uh, which is a substantial commitment because of the number of applications. So I spend my time going back and forth, a lot of communication on all those committees, but uh, uh, the next step will be, we'll have CWC at our December 15th meeting to really update in some detail about what's happening there. So any questions on those committees? I mean, I know I did that very quickly, but uh, okay, hearing none, uh, let's move to the next item on the agenda, which is staff reports. And uh, Mike, you want to talk about the affordable housing text amendment? Mayor, real quickly, oh. uh, there was one more report on the Salt Lake Valley Emergency Communication Center. Oh, I went right past it. I was trying to be quick. Please and go I have ahead. A, I have a really long presentation on this that I was looking forward to share. So if that, that's that's why I didn't want to miss yeah, don't it. Don't take more than 30 minutes. <laughs> Real, real quickly, we're making a lot of really good progress um, in this area because of the great leadership that we have with our new executive director, Scott Ruff. He's stepped in. His expertise is very evident and his experience by the things that he's proposed and the way he's come in and really grasped the budget issues. Um, he's, he's made some recommendations and improvements on technology and is really helping to uh, pursue that. He's also been very good at uh, working through the finances. We now have a finance committee. We have a deputy director over finance, a position that was proposed. And so I'm feeling much, much better about the transparency with the financials and budget processes, which he's done a great job on. And then the computer aided dispatch, uh, the project that is moving forward, I've given you updates on that. And that continues to move forward, which is an important aspect of what they're doing. So very positive things and uh, great leadership with our new executive director. Happy to answer questions. No, we're excited to see some things turn around there because I think there was some fears, I know, from uh, UFA and, and police. So uh, we, we appreciate seeing that things are moving in a positive direction. Any, again, any last comments on any of the committees? Appreciate all your efforts. Uh, uh, because of those efforts, it's less time we have to meet as a group, but uh, we know we're well represented on all those fronts. So again, thank you. Now, back to Mike Johnson on uh, affordable housing text amendment. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, we, we had a pretty lengthy discussion at the last meeting, but I will bring that up again. I've added a few new slides to this. Um, just to show some of the information we've gotten since that last meeting. Okay. So this is an, an applicant initiated text amendment uh, from Rockworth Development. So they, they've gone through the, the standard zoning text amendment application process and are proposing to modify the affordable housing provision, the below market rate housing provision in the PDD ordinance, which is chapter 19.51. Uh, this is a summary I showed last time. Um, the initial proposal when the applicant made an application was um, to, to change, basically the, the applicant proposal there says a minimum of 10% of units in a project shall be provided as BMR units if affordable at or below 80% um, area median income. The only difference between the proposal and the existing ordinance is the existing ordinance requires those units affordable at 50% area median income rather than 80. Um, staff's recommendation to the Planning Commission uh, was, was uh, relatively receptive to this as 80% still does comply with the city's uh, affordable housing goals. It's still considered affordable housing and 80%, as I've shown before, is, is commonly known as a, as a standard affordable housing rate or median income housing rate. Um, at the, the local, state, and federal level. But we recommended at the time of rather than 10% of units in a project be BMR, uh, 15 to 20% of units uh, be provided as BMR units. 
that's to kind of create a trade-off for allowing uh, units to be slightly less affordable at that 80% AMI than at 50%, the trade-off being, well, they should provide additional units then if that's the case. Uh, we, we've been preparing to, to bring forward a, a city-initiated amendment to the PDD ordinance, the entire ordinance, for a lot of it's just pretty standard cleanup and, and clarification. Uh, our consultant landmark design presented to the council, I don't know, probably almost a year ago at this point to share the progress on that. Um, I pulled the June 2020 draft, which was the most recent draft we had of that city initiated amendment to see what we were recommending as a city, um, at least in that draft ordinance. And keep in mind, this has not gone through the public process yet. But in that draft ordinance, the, the recommendation is there is, is to provide 15% of units at 80% AMI um, with flexibility if 50% if or lower AMI units are provided, uh, potentially allowing a decrease in the total number of units provided. So uh, the reason we haven't brought that forward for approval yet is, and we're actually introducing it to Planning Commission tomorrow, uh, the, the Rockworth PDD actual development application had come in already it was already vested under the, the current city code. And we felt that um, trying to juggle the current city code uh, and that proposal against a city initiated amendment to the ordinance that wouldn't apply to that project, but would apply to future projects would be kind of confusing. Um, so, so we held off and are now introducing the city initiated amendment to the commission now that they have made a recommendation on the actual development application. However, th this is just to state that in, in our draft from June, um, the, the recommendation as a starting point for discussion is providing 15% of units in a project at 80% AMI with that flexibility. Um, the applicant, after going through planning commission, um, revised their proposal to be, uh, they, they said they were comfortable changing their proposal to 15% of units in a project being provided at 80% AMI, um, so, so they were comfortable with that increase. The Planning Commission, though, recommended that 20% of units be provided as affordable uh, at or below 80% AMI, again, with that flexibility added. Um, with that recommendation by the Commission, they, they voted six to one to recommend approval. Um, keep in mind, though, the, the applicant has, has revised their provision to 15%, not the 20% the Commission recommended. A staff, we've looked at this based on this context and, and some other information that I'll go through. We, you know, we're still comfortable with 15% of units, um, but I, I do want to acknowledge that it is different than what was recommended ultimately by the Planning Commission. This is just spelled out more. Um, this is the actual verbatim proposed language in that city initiated draft uh, of the PDD ordinance. Um, like I said, the big thing uh, here is uh, the proposal to use uh, giving developers options to provide units at 50% AMI or in that income band between 50 and 80% AMI. Uh, it, and again, this is exactly as we just as I just discussed. If if it's proposed between 50 and 80%, then at least 15 units in a project must um, must be provided at that rate. Uh, if it's proposed at 50% AMI, then only 10% of projects containing 50 units are provided at that rate. If there's a mix of those two, um, the, the required number of affordable units is subject to council discretion. Um, so, so that's how it sits right now in the ordinance we're presenting as a city initiated amendment to the Planning Commission tomorrow. However, we are recommending before the commission make any recommendation on the city initiated amendment that this um, applicant initiated amendment play out first. So we want to get through the, the Rockworth proposal before the Planning Commission uh, makes a final recommendation to the council so we can update them with, you know, the results of this process. Uh, staff sent a bunch of uh, research that uh, was requested. We looked into what other cities are doing. We asked other cities in the area. You can see the cities listed there. There's 16 or 17 of them. We didn't get responses from all of them, um, but we asked them a few questions. Uh, we asked them if they had ordinances that require affordable housing. Uh, we asked if they have affordable housing projects currently in their city. We asked the average 
housing cost in those projects, whether it be 80% AMI, 50% AMI, or something different. Uh, we ask the percentage of affordable units uh, in each of those projects. And then we ask them about um, just um, common sources of funding for how those projects were built. Were they financed uh, completely privately? Were there public subsidies? Um, you know, how were they developed? Uh, fully acknowledging that you know the method we used to survey was we reached out with phone calls and emails to staff in, in these municipalities. So it's by no means a scientific survey. Uh, we wanted to share the, the most updated information we had with you to provide this context. So of those cities that responded and were surveyed, uh, only two of them have strict requirements, ordinances with strict requirements for affordable housing, being Park City and West Jordan. Um, Orem City has an optional senior housing overlay zone. Um, and and if, uh, if someone wants to develop senior housing, um, they can, but they have to provide some of those at 80% AMI. Um, Murray City has um, options that grant development bonuses if affordable housing units are provided in some areas. And West Jordan, um, their ordinance uh, is kind of similar to ours. It's a planned community ordinance. I think it's, it's mainly focused on residential development, um, but it, it requires at least 5%, but less than 10% uh, to be affordable housing units. So that actually limits the, it requires affordable housing, but also limits the number of affordable housing units in those developments. Um, cities with existing affordable housing developments. Um, you know, we tried to summarize the information we got back the best we can. Um, I think almost every city in Utah is going to have probably older market rate housing projects that just based on the value that they can charge for rent could qualify as being affordable, but that doesn't mean they're, they're deed restricted or, or income restricted or anything like that. So um, kind of setting aside that many cities have older kind of multifamily development projects or single family areas where, um, you know, the monthly housing cost is considered affordable. Um, the, the cities that reported actual uh, deed restricted or income limited projects were uh, they're listed there. Mill Creek, Murray, Sandy, Harriman, Park City, South Jordan, West Valley, and West Jordan and South Jordan. Uh, and, and they're kind of all over the place. Some of them are, they're not mixed income. It, they're all, they're 100% affordable housing projects. Some have a few units. Um, some are, have multiple units that are all across the board in terms of the, the income that they're provided at. We're trying to uh, average those out in, in, in the responses. Uh, of nine cities that responded to our question about average housing costs that actually had the information, six of those utilized 80% AMI. Uh, one was reported at 50% and another one was 50 to 60% AMI, which was a uh, section eight housing development out in Harriman. Uh, in projects, the average percentage of affordable units in a project, um, again, we got varied responses, um, largely dependent on how these projects were funded. Um, Park City requires, they, they have the, uh, you know, an ordinance probably most similar to what ours is trying to achieve. They require 20% of units to be affordable in development projects. And, and they have a city goal to have 800 affordable units in their city uh, in the next six years. And then again, the West Jordan requirement. Um, but, but like I said, a, a lot of cities have developments where they're almost entirely affordable housing uh, developments. Um, relatively few had the mixed income projects like the, the PDD in Cotland Heights tries to achieve. And then we asked about funding sources, how these projects were funded. 11 of the cities listed there responded to this. 10 cities reported subsidizing some, um, but not necessarily all uh, affordable housing projects. And some of these cities have a lot of these projects. So, uh, you know, they, they may all have been fund, funded or financed differently, but um, it, a common response is that the city helped provide some sort of fee waiver or subsidy or CRA set aside or something like that. And then of projects that were privately financed, um, we saw low income housing tax credits used a lot uh, Section 8 housing, and, and that program was used for that one in Harriman. HUD financing, and then housing authority subsidies. Uh, in some cases, uh, this isn't included here because we just got this information uh, recently, but 
the city actually owned the land and um, you know, Park City has actually developed some of their own housing. So the city's acted as a developer there. Um, you know, there've been land donations, uh, you know, impact fee waivers and things like that. So this gives you an idea of what's going on in other cities. I think the big takeaway here is that very few are actually requiring affordable housing. They're, they're finding other ways to provide it. Um, they're providing, um, you know, some, some level of, of assistance to see these things be implemented. Um, but, but our PDD ordinance is fairly unique, um, at least in the local area in, in the requirement to provide affordable housing. Uh, so with that in mind, the, like I said, the city's ordinance is, is one of few that, that have this as an actual requirement. And, and the way we look at it is this PDD ordinance really is the, the only logical development option for some of these projects, especially the gravel pit. Um, so, you know, it's not an overlay zone, that's an option. It's, you know, it, it's, it's the primary tool that uh, we think developers are gonna use to um, redevelop these targeted areas. Which, which helps us in achieving this affordable housing goal. Uh, we feel that the, the increase from 50% AMI to 80% AMI as proposed in this amendment still allows us to meet the affordable housing goals we have adopted. And we have listed the PDD as one of the tools we're gonna use to achieve that. The increase in number of units in a project from 10% to 15% uh, allows the provision of more affordable units than the current ordinance while still meeting those community housing needs. So, so we, we do get more units out of this still at a, a rate that's considered affordable. Uh, and as was discussed briefly in the last meeting, uh, and I think mentioned by the applicant, private financing for 15% of units in a project is, um, is more feasible than private financing for 20% of units in a project. Now that's, that's gonna depend, that's gonna be on a project by project basis, but in talking to um, you know, just a few uh, people in the development community and in commercial real estate and financing, uh, at, at a project of the scale of something like the gravel pit, um, th this statement, th there was general consensus that this would be true. Uh, increasing uh, the required number of units to 20% or leaving the ordinance as is with the 50% AMI units, it is, they're totally valid options. Uh, but they, they will likely increase uh, some level of need or, or the number of requests the city gets for subsidies or fee waivers or, or funding assistance in some way, like I said, especially for the larger projects. In a smaller project like the, the Walsh development that was approved a couple years ago, they, they may be okay regardless of what the requirement is, but, but the larger ones, um, you know, the, the performance come back and 80% and AMI, there, there are a lot of funding options for that and uh, Fifteen percent seems to be a, 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 a feasible number, and, and again, just based on the feedback we got, that that gets less feasible the the higher that percentage goes above fifteen. Uh, and then uh, it was brought up last time to try to develop a formula um, if a project proposes a mix of units that are eighty percent AMI, fifty percent AMI, something different. Um, we can certainly try to do that, um, but one of the, the primary uh, intentions of the, the city initiated amendment was to create a little bit more flexibility with council and planning commission discretion. Uh, you know, if we set a formula and, you know, maybe a, a, an applicant comes forward and has a, a, and a good idea that makes good logical sense, but the way we developed our formula, they're half a unit short or something like that. Um, and, you know, the option doesn't work. This is theoretical, obviously, but, uh, you know, I think staff's recommendation would be to allow it up to the discretion of the commission and the city council. Obviously, we, what we don't want to see is someone say, well, I'm providing units that are 75% AMI, so I should need to provide less. And I think the, the safeguard against that is we're still requiring these to be in these commonly recognized income bands. So we've got 80%, we've got 50%, and then you have a 30% band. So th those would be like the, the magic numbers we're looking at there in determining you know, the right mix and what percentage of units are required. So our recommendation, at least tonight, and we're happy to explore this further, would be to leave that formula uh, flexible and just uh, leave it up to the discretion of the commission and the city council. Uh, it was also brought up and a question was asked where the 50% AMI requirement that's in the ordinance today came from. Uh, we looked back at this and looked through 
previous staff reports and research and meeting minutes. And this was done by staff that um, is, is not with the city anymore. The original drafts of the ordinance didn't have any affordable housing requirement. Um, and then it was added and, and we've determined it was added based on an ordinance from Stamford, Connecticut. They had a transit oriented development ordinance that saved in our, uh, that project research file. And the language in that ordinance is almost verbatim uh, the same as what's in the current PDD ordinance. I don't know what the rationale was for using Stamford, Connecticut of all places to determine our affordable housing provision, but, but that's, when we were reviewing old drafts, um, you know, they, there was no affordable housing provision saved in the first couple drafts. Then this Stamford, Connecticut code was saved in the file and the next draft that came out included the, the same affordable housing language. So this is the best we can conclude. Um, so again, I, I don't know what the rationale was. There wasn't a lot of discussion in the meeting minutes that we could find. Um, you know, it, it could be that there aren't a lot of uh, local examples of this. Um, so uh, the staff at the time was trying to find something, uh, but, but that's, you know, that's the information we were able to find as far as how that originated. And then again, this would be a text amendment that would apply to the code, to all projects moving forward. However, uh, a real world example of this, how this change could impact the number of affordable units in a project. Uh, this, this is the site plan for the, uh, the Northern Gravel Pit development, which will be introduced to you in two weeks. The current ordinance requires uh, 42 units. Um, they're providing or proposing 419 total units. 10% of that is 42. Uh, an increase to 15% would, would increase that by 21 units up to 63. And then 20% of that is 84 units. So that shows you uh, a project of this scale, how 5% um, you know, changes the total number of units provided. Uh, I have all these existing affordable housing provisions in here. I, I won't go over all these again, but they're there if you have questions. I did add on this slide, um, the, the AMI, the Area Median Income in Cottonwood Heights is, is just over 86,000. 80% 80 AMI is, is almost 69,000 and then 50% is about 43,000. And again, if, if housing is considered affordable, uh, that means that housing and, and its associated costs do not encumber more than 30% of that AMI. So that, that's what I have for you tonight. Again, staff uh, is supportive of the uh, proposal as it's been revised by the applicant. Um, that being said, this is a legislative de decision. The, the commission recommended 20%. Um, you know, there wasn't a clear finding for that recommendation of 20 over 15. I, I think the commission just wanted to see, you know, if, if the city allows a, a higher affordability rate, then they ought to provide more units and, you know, they recommended 20. Um, but, but staff is supportive of 15% and um, I'll leave it at that and answer any questions you have. Okay, Mike, that's, that's a lot of information. I appreciate your research and sharing it. Um, uh, let's open up to the council for some comments, and I have a couple of questions, but uh, Councilmember Michael, you had a question, I think. I did. I think it was uh, on slide maybe eight, perhaps. It was the gravel pit one. There you go. Um, I believe I asked the developer last meeting how many units they could um, cite on the, the landscape of their site plan, and I thought it was like it, I don't believe it was 419. Can you clarify that number for me again? Um, well, 419 is is the current proposal. I, I, I'm not I'm not talking about the proposal. I'm talking about the, the the acreage and the and the number of units they could put on it. Oh, the maximum density. Correct. Uh, well, in the PDD zone, it, it, there is no not, maximum density number. Are you? That's not that's not what my question is. Sorry, I'll be more clear this time. Given the number of acreage and the number of units per acre, how many could they put here? Not I, I, assuming, I thought you said 35 units. Yeah, I thought so, they said 35 units per acre. So that would be utilizing the mixed use ordinance, which is, it's not what they're proposing obviously, but in the mixed use ordinance, which is what we see at uh, Canyon Center and uh, most of our other newer um, commercial and residential mixed developments, the, the maximum density is 35 units to the acre. I, I, I'm, 
it's really difficult to, um, to project the total number of units taking into account site constraints and parking requirements and setbacks because density can be presented in, in, in a lot of different ways. You can have a, a structure that looks like a house that has one unit. You can also have a structure that looks like a house that's, that's a, a fourplex and, and they look identical from the outside, but the way they're divided up on the inside is very different. So I, I think the intention in the mixed use ordinance um, is that 35 units to, acre, to the acre is, is in most cases not going to be the, the limiting factor in how many units are provided. The limiting factors are the design of the, the development, meeting setbacks, meeting parking standards, taking into account site constraints and landscaping requirements and things like that. Um, and, and it encourages um, developments to be efficient in how they're designed so that they can maximize you know, the density that they're trying to achieve. So it's really hard to just scale that to this site without, you know, without this site being designed with that code in mind. This is a completely different ordinance and you know, this, this presents a lot of different things that the mixed use ordinance couldn't do and um, wouldn't allow, but it's, it's just a different code. So that, that's okay. a non-answer I know, but it's really that's hard an answer. to do Yeah, so we'll just start, we'll just time out there and we'll talk about this offline. But I guess from, from my perspective, from more of a policy perspective, I think about the last three years or so that I've been on the council and what I hear from people in my district. One is that there's, I would say that there's not a high level of support for ADUs, but there is a high level of support for um, people to have their children live in our community as they graduate from college there's a, I think a high um, interest in having those who work in our city live in our city, whether it be um, city staff, police, fire, um, people working at Alpha Coffee or whomever it is. Like, uh, there's also this notion of how can we create a city that we're not um, driving everywhere. So more transit oriented. And so when I think about those things that I hear from my district, I, I, I think about how do we turn that into a policy? So. If, if those in my districts aren't, aren't interested in, in ADUs, how do you create a place for those people to live? And that's through, I think, looking at the AMI and looking at more of a range of not just 80%, but 50%, if you can go back to that slide. So I think taking away what the, the you know, just thinking about a policy and not thinking about a particular development, I think about how do I wanna leave a legacy? How do I, how do I wanna cre create a community that is encompassing for all and welcome to all? And I, I, I see myself as looking more towards what the planning commission has requested, which is the, or recommended the 20%, but I also see this need for looking at 50% as well as AMI. One of our residents who came to the open space honk and wave that we had last, last week um, works for Salt Lake City in affordable housing and uh, I talked to both council member Peterson and I, and, and was, she was really making the point of, of that 50 to 80% range as well. So I, I, from my perspective, I just want to put it out there that that's, that's where I'll be looking at and putting my attention and, 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 and voting. So thank you. Other comments from other council members? Mike, I have a quick question. And, and this is another project that took place way before, you know, before we were a city the Highland Pinnacle, do they have any any of these numbers that we can have any perspective on on that, even though it's obviously grandfathered, I'm sure? I don't think any units in there are income restricted or deed restricted. Um, you know, we could certainly get the uh, the rents that they're charging, but I think they're they're in line with market rate rents of, you know, of a similar development built around the time those were. It's not going to be what you're you know, the new quote unquote luxury apartments are charging for rent, but, you know, I think it's still, it's still market rate given the, the age of that development. I think so, Santa, Santa Fe has some of the uh, uh, income housing funds there. A question. I, I have a theory that maybe previous council went with some more aggressive um, ask of the developer in that this is such a, a rare east side undeveloped property when we're trying to compare ourselves with some of these west side cities that still have an abundance of undeveloped land 
Um, it's not a very accurate comparison. And so maybe that ordinance was written with the with a stronger ask because this is a PDD, because council gets so much say. And I think the the legacy that Christine's talking about is a valuable one. You're out of time. I'm 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 probably somewhere in the middle personally. Um, I I kind of like the the attitude of the planning commission who spent a lot of time looking at this. Uh, one is if we move up the AMI from 50 up to the 80, that that then should require a higher percentage of units uh, uh, available. Um, I I'm 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 comfortable with the 80 percent AMI. I think that's still doable. Uh, but if you want to go to the 80%, then I would agree with the planning commission that we probably need to go to 20% of the number of units, which I think would be would be substantial. Um, and looking at 80% uh, AMI being at $68,000, um, uh, I think that's I think that's doable. But that's just one quick thought. Mike, what's um, your time frame on this? This is this is uh, at the council's discretion. So um, you know, it's an active application that was initiated from an applicant. So we you know we want to move through it, but if there are concerns or if you'd like us to address some of these these comments with the applicant, we can do that and bring it back. It, it's up to you. I'm not so concerned about discussing with the applicant. I think it's more of a a policy legislative philosophy going forward because it, it's it's other projects as well so uh, mayor we and, and it is up to the council on when they want to see this we were we were we brought this last or two weeks ago we were going to talk about it tonight like we've done and then we were going to put it on for consideration at the next meeting unless the council wants to see other information or move that to a different time so just that's what we were thinking at least prior well, I'm personally supportive of, of the 80-20 as the planning commission has suggested. Um, but again, if we want more dialogue, I, I'm definitely not closing the door on uh, modifying my position because it's, it, it's a challenging thing. And I know the legislature with ADUs and stuff may be coming up with some directives that we may be forced to uh, incorporate. Yeah. I was just going to suggest, I mean, I, I liked the planning commissions. I stated this last time, their recommendation. I thought that was okay. Um, I was going to suggest or at least see the temperature of the council that if, because one of the things that at least the comment was, is that if it's at 15%, it's easier to get private financing. And if it's at 20% of the units need to be this way, then they're going to be looking more likely to come and ask for tacking, tax increment funding and i didn't know if that might be a, a change point for some of the council that if the project is completely privately financed without any t tax increment funding or cra type things does that then make you move off that 20 percent and make 15 percent okay um i guess that would that kind of just puts that theory to the to the fire test you know you, 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 said, you said that's the case you know, now prove it, or would you be more willing to keep it at the 20 and then be also willing to allow the uh, TIF funds to be used to help uh, the project move forward? Are, are you remembering that right, Scott? I seem to remember the private funding be being tied to the 80% as opposed to the 50%, yeah. but not tied to the 15 versus 20. Correct. Okay. No, what, what I thought I heard Mike say tonight was that they said, well, if it's only 15% of the units at 80, that's easier to get complete private financing, where if it was 20% yeah. of the uh, units, that would be more difficult. Did I misunderstand you? No, you both are correct. I think Tally just said what you just said, that if, if it was 20%, that may require some requests for support from a CDA or, or increment financing of some kind. Yeah. Both both are actually correct. Um, keeping it at 50% AMI, um, even at potentially at 10% of units, again, given the examples we have, which is the gravel pit, uh, would likely result in a, a CRA request. 80% um, AMI at 20% of units would do the same. 
Um, the applicant stated in the last work se session that 80% AMI at 15% per of units could be privately financed. That's, that's one example. That's not every project, but that's what was stated by the applicant. Okay, looking at our agenda, the, you know, time is short. Um, does the council want further discussion in a future meeting or uh, I'd be interested in hearing each council member's position and we can determine if we need to, if we can move forward with an action item next meeting or we need further analysis or further debate? I, I personally, I, I feel like I'm still, I've got my head wrapped around what we're giving versus what we're getting in terms of the whole development. So I'd love to spend a little time with Mike Johnson um, to maybe understand where I'm missing missing things. And so I, I would I would I would propose we wait until January so that I could have some time to get with you, Mike, to understand yeah. the project in general. I'm feeling a little bit of that myself, even though I, I kind of have a position. I I don't feel solid 100% committed to that position because it's 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 a lot and it's uh, and I'm 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 also a little curious what the legislature is going to come back to us with regarding affordable housing. Um, I know this fits into our uh, what we approved on our our goals for affordable housing. So. Other council positions? Do you want a little more discussion or? I'm fine with the discussion. I mean, it, it, it is very complex. I guess with there being that much, I mean, ultimately the, the, the developers willing is able to come and present us with, you know, whatever they want. If, if with that being the case, is us delaying a decision on this really impact them that much, Mike, or I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Are they, I mean, they could, even, even the ideas I threw out, if they're willing to, if they want to suggest an 80%, but only 80% of AMI and 15% and say, you know, we're not going to ask you for a dime of TIF, they can present that with, without a text amendment. But yeah, they we can't hold them to that though. Um, well, they're limited by the actual PDD ordinance right now, which, yeah. Uh, in terms of timing, no, um, there, there's not a major difference between taking action in two weeks and, and down the road a little bit because, at least from this developer's perspective, it's a, it's a citywide tax amendment, but it, it ties to their proposed development, which is just going to be introduced to the council in December and, and definitely won't be ready for any kind of decision, you know, in the next couple of meetings. Yeah, even that presentation gives us more information because, in, in all honesty, I, I've not really looked at the development and understand it in all honesty. So um, I'm fine uh, and, and comfortable giving us a little bit more time to better understand the issues related to the tax amendment and affordable housing as it relates to the gravel pit. And I would also note this is the second time TOD, the Transit Oriented Development Language has come up in the PDD that we've had a uh, city initiated or other initiated text amendment that came up with the Walsh. That was where that original, the 25 units or the 25 feet, I don't remember what it was. We changed it to 35 because it was kind of, it was, it was basically based on a, on a transit oriented development code someplace. This yeah. may have that same similar type of source. We do need to make it so that it works here. So, um, but yeah, we certainly can spend some time discussing in our next meeting. Um, I probably wouldn't mind a some sp more specifics on this particular application. I agree as well. I think there's the 80%, obviously the planning commission, Mike, did they talk a little bit about the ramifications if they went 80, are they going to ask for those those funds or was that even part of the subject or or? discussion no not with the planning commission i i think the applicant just stated it um in the last work session is at at their proposed rate they can finance it privately at at other rates they can't so i you know i think staff's takeaway is affordable housing is critically important it's a priority we want to work to implement regardless of the options in front of us there there are trade-offs in every direction so it's it's really a policy level discussion on where the council wants to take it so 
So I think it, it's, you know, we're supportive of, of achieving affordable housing. So, yeah. you know, we're supportive of the, the proposal as recommended. We will support and work to implement anything else that the council wants. I think we're close. Uh, so uh, I'll work with Tim to work this into a future agenda and uh, please share with us uh, additional questions you have. We'll work with Mike of providing answers and uh, appreciate the applicants understanding that this is a, an important decision. We want to do it right. So we'll take just a little bit more time, but we'll move on it as judiciously as we can. Um, with that being said, uh, I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn and move to the plaza for a tree lighting uh, 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 ceremony real quickly and then uh, and then uh, reconvene at our uh, business meeting at uh, seven o'clock. So moved, Mayor. It's been moved by Council Member Bruce to adjourn. Uh, do I have a second? Oh, well, yeah, I was muted, but I did so. Okay, it was seconded by Council Brack and uh, uh, any questions? Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. More importantly, aye. is anyone opposed? Let the record show that unanimous. We are adjourned and we will reconvene at seven o'clock for our business meeting. Thank you.